Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the uh, United Church of Stratford, Vermont, um, to this uh, second event in our speaker series entitled Election 2024, uh, What is at Stake? Um, welcome to you who are in the sanctuary and welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Uh, my name is Tom Kinder, and I am the, the pastor here. Um, and we always begin by acknowledging that we are on the ancestral and unceded land of the traditional caretakers, the Western Abenaki or Wabanaki people. Um, part of our stewardship of this land is to govern the society that inhabits it responsibly. And that means, in part, being well informed and actively engaged in electoral politics. We are hosting this series in our church uh, in the sanctuary because uh, we believe this is a sacred duty um, and our choices need to be made in the context of our highest ethical values and philosophical ideals. But this is in no way a religious event. Uh, we have no agenda uh, other than our two stated goals. Uh, first, to educate ourselves about what is at stake in the November uh, 5th, 2024 election uh, in a variety of issue areas. And second, to inspire ourselves to become uh, active and, um, and devote time and resources to help elect candidates who are more aligned with the nation and world that we each want to create. Um, whoever those candidates may be. Uh, we intend to abide well within the uh, IRS guidelines uh, for a church on the re requirements, uh, which means that we will not directly or indirectly endorse or oppose any candidate. Um, we've asked all the speakers in this series to make clear the difference between the two major parties and their candidates on one particular set of issues. Uh, based on what the parties and the candidates have done in the past and about what they've said um, uh, about their future intentions. Um, so whatever your perspective, uh, we welcome you here this evening. And, um, and, and this church aspires to be a, a safe place uh, where people of differing views uh, will regard one another with respect um, and with compassion and with care. Uh, where we will listen deeply to understand the other person's perspective, even if we do not share it. Um, so we'll have a, a question and an answer period, uh, and we ask that you not criticize or debate argumentatively or attack another person, but simply state your own views and know that um, they will be honored with the same respect that you're giving to others. Uh, this is not, of course, to say that we can't feel strong emotions um, and passionate concerns because, of course, we will, we do. Um, but it is, asked, it is to ask that we aim them at the uh, issues and principles and values and ideals and not turn them toward other people. Um, please remember that we're here because we all share what our neighbor, William Sloan Coffin, called a passion for the possible. Uh, we are here because we all want a nation that fulfills its highest ideals and is a blessing uh, to its people and to the world. So let us put our hearts and minds uh, together this evening as, uh, as one for the good of all. It's my honor and, um, and my uh, real joy uh, to introduce our speaker, Jim Antal. Um, if it is a sacred duty to be good stewards of our society, uh, it is even more so to be good stewards of the earth. And those two sacred stewardships are really one. Um, so it is important to note that this is the Reverend Dr. Jim Antal, <laughs> um, and that he comes to this issue not only as a nationally known and respected expert on climate issues, uh, but also as special advisor on climate justice to a major mainline Protestant denomination. Um, and as someone who has worked with hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of churches helping people grapple uh, with this issue. 
Um, Jim is the uh, author of the highly acclaimed book, um, Climate Church, Climate World, and the new edition is, um, is on the table in the back. If anybody would like to uh, purchase a copy, there's a basket um, and a sign, which will tell you everything. Um, Jim is a, an insightful, articulate, and passionate student of this complex topic. Uh, well qualified to address the questions of why the impacts on climate and environment deserve our attention and what the records on climate and environment of the two leading national parties and presidential candidates are and what the climate and environmental plans, policies, promises and pledges offered by the parties and candidates are. Um, but as if that task were not enough, uh, the presidential candidate of one of the two parties, in case you hadn't noticed, changed <laughs> three days ago. <laughs> and I've been thinking, I've been thinking of poor Jim, <laughs> you know, having to prepare this, I don't know, uh, three drafts? Is that what? Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing your insights um, with even more eager anticipation. And um, thank you. Please welcome Jim Anton. Well, I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to the United Church of Stratford for organizing this speaker series on what's at stake in the coming election. I was grateful to Ron Smola's address, Democracy and the Law, and I hope to attend the upcoming sessions on economic issues and individual rights. Uh, but tonight, I'll be focusing on what's at stake when it comes to climate and the environment. I'll begin with a brief overview explaining why the impacts on climate and environment deserve our attention. And then I'll review the records of former President Trump's term in office and the Biden-Harris term thus far. I'll conclude with a sampling of the climate and environment plans, policies, promises, and pledges offered by former President Trump, as well as those offered by the Biden-Harris team. You can already see how I've edited it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Finally, given that President Biden recently announced his decision not to run for re-election, it's important to recognize at the beginning of my remarks that the leadership of the Democratic Party is united in its science-based understanding of the climate crisis and environmental threats, as well as their recognition of the essential role the federal government must play in transitioning to a clean energy economy. While it appears that Kamala Harris is the likely nominee, whoever heads the Democratic ticket will most certainly support, expand, and accelerate the climate and environmental policies President Biden has championed the past three and a half years. Now, before we examine the contrasting records of the candidates, I, I want to briefly review why the impacts on climate and environment deserve our attention. All of humanity, whatever our politics, whatever the color of our skin, whatever our country, rich or poor, educated or not, old or young, politically engaged, apathetic or nihilistic, all of humanity is united by the fact that our life and the life as we and all of our ancestors for two million years have always known it depends upon a stable climate and a life-supporting environment. In fact, what we refer to as civilization itself only became possible about 11,000 years ago when the climate stabilized, thus allowing humanity to settle down, to farm our own food, and to live in year-round communities. Thus, civilization emerges from and depends upon a stable climate, or what I like to call the continuity of creation. But that continuity is now broken. Once the industrial era began, it took us only seven generations to decreate the planet. 
Over the past 200 years, humanity has extracted and burned about half the oil, coal, and gas that nature took 150 million years to make. That's how the developed countries built the modern world. In doing so, a tiny percentage of us became unimaginably wealthy, profiting from the control over and the abuse of resources that they had nothing to do with creating. At the same time, a majority of people worldwide are living amidst increased inequality, poverty, hunger, homelessness, and a lack of potable water. These injustices are casualties of the unjust acquisition, extraction, distribution, and profit from the energy stored under our feet. And to address those injustices, humanity must complete the greatest transition we have ever attempted, moving from our dependence on fossil fuel to a reliance on renewable and sustainable forms of clean energy. This necessary transition cannot be undertaken without the leadership from nation states. And in 2024, over 4 billion people in 50 different countries, including the United States, have the opportunity to elect their leaders. The fact that elections matter has never been more obvious. The 2024 election will be a singular event in the climate crisis. As world-renowned primatologist Jane Goodall said in January to world leaders at Davos, this year could be the most consequential voting year in terms of the fate of our planet. Truly, we are living on the hinge of history. We need to elect leaders who recognize the enormity of our present crisis and the urgent necessity of negotiating and implementing an incredibly fast transition to clean, renewable, sustainable energy. As much as we may not want to face it, it's essential for Americans to understand the enormity of our present crisis and why it is urgent that we take action on climate immediately. Here's what I mean. It's been over 125,000 years since the Earth has been as warm as it was last year in 2023. And for the first time, the 12-month period that ended in February exceeded 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Scientists have warned that if global warming continues to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius, as it has now for several months, the world's tropics could become uninhabitable. 2.5 billion people live in the world's tropics. And yesterday and the day before were the two warmest days in recorded history. In Maui and Canada and the countries around the Mediterranean, the fires are raging like a blowtorch. This past summer, the ocean off the southern Florida uh, coast rivaled the hot tubs in the resorts as they hit 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Our oceans are warming at a rate almost half again as fast as we thought they were warming only five years ago. We now know that air pollution caused by burning fossil fuel kills almost 9 million people a year. The, that's more than malaria, HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis combined. And that doesn't even include the lives lost due to the impact of increased global warming. 70% of CO2 pollution comes from the richest 20% of the people in the world. Since 1950, the number of floods across the world has increased by 15 times. Extreme pressure events by extreme temperature events by 20 times and wildfires by sevenfold. A quarter of the world's population are one drought away from running out of water. The Greenland ice sheet is now melting seven times faster than it was in the 1990s. The fifth national climate assessment tells us 
that these deadly crises are unprecedented in human history and the effects are worsening across every region of the United States. In other words, the past decade is the hottest decade since records have been kept and the past decade will be the coolest decade your children and your grandchildren will ever experience. With all of this in mind, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez recently said, climate breakdown has begun, our climate is imploding faster than we can cope with extreme weather events hitting every corner of the planet. Surging temperatures demand a surge in action. The actions taken by whoever serves as president over the next four years will either accelerate the transition that scientists have identified as essential or, as Bill McKibben points out, it will do damage that will last, in human terms, forever. Damage that will be visible in the geologic record for eons to come. The remainder of my presentation will provide you first with a summary of Trump's record and the Biden-Harris record on climate and environment as reported by the major news outlets which are reflected in the footnotes of my presentation. Then I will offer a sampling of each candidate's plans, policies, promises and pledges when it comes to climate, energy and the environment. Once again as reported by major news outlets and, reflect, and that is reflected in the footnotes. So when it comes to climate and environment, what did Donald Trump do during his four years as president? Many of you will recall that in the first few months, President Trump pulled the United States out of the Paris Climate Accord. He also approved both the Keystone XL pipeline, for which Gus and I were arrested, protesting it back in 2011, and I again in 2013, as well as the Dakota Access Pipeline. But that doesn't begin to scratch the surface. Beginning January 20th, 2017, over the course of four years, President Trump officially reversed, revoked, or otherwise, otherwise rolled back 98 environmental rules. And his appointees were still working on more than a dozen rollbacks when he left office. To quote one analysis of the consequences of these rollbacks, in 2019 alone, these rollbacks led to 22,000 deaths, mostly from a rise in airborne particulate matter. Here are just a few of the highlights from Trump's four years in office. He repealed the Clean Power Plan. He rolled back the fuel efficiency standards for passenger cars and trucks. He lifted a ban on offshore drilling, thus allowing new offshore drilling for oil and gas in nearly all U.S. coastal waters. He also opened the Arctic to oil and gas drilling. He opened Bears Ears and Escalante National Monuments to drilling. He removed protection for up to half the country's wetlands and one-fifth the country's streams. He also rescinded the moratorium on coal mining on federal lands. He issued a rule following a rule allowing rail shipments of liquefied natural gas. He put tariffs on solar panel imports. He freed oil and gas companies from any responsibility to detect or repair methane leaks from existing or new wells. As a point of reference, in Oklahoma alone, there are about half a million abandoned oil and gas wells. He dissolved the Advisory Committee for the, for the Sustained National Climate Assessment and gave as his reason that scientists were getting in the way. He removed climate change from the list of threats to national security. He used the COVID pandemic as an excuse to suspend environmental reviews and public comment for highways, pipelines, and oil and gas projects. 
While Trump was running for president in 2016, he called for the Environment, Environmental Protection Agency to be dismantled. During his first 18 months in office, the EPA lost more than 1,200 employees. An EPA website devoted to climate change was relegated to an archival site, meaning that it was not searchable anymore from the web and could no longer be updated. Scott Pruitt served as Trump's first EPA administrator. One of his main qualifications for the job was that as the Attorney General of Oklahoma, he had sued the EPA countless times. Trump's second EPA administrator had served as a lawyer and lobbyist for a firm that represented several polluting industries, including coal. Under President Trump, 34 toxic Superfund sites remained untouched. This was the biggest backlog of underfunded and unfunded Superfund cleanup projects in 15 years. The strategic plan for 2018 to 2022 developed by the EPA does not mention climate change. Neither does FEMA's strategic plan for the same period. Trump decided to relocate the headquarters of the Bureau of Land Management from Washington, D.C. to Grand Junction, Colorado. The move resulted in 87% of the employees leaving their positions. Trump appointees buried a proposal from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that would have transformed our electric grid so it could handle the transition from electricity generated by fossil fuels to electricity generated by solar, wind, water, and batteries. While this assessment is far from comprehensive, I'll leave it at that for now. Let's turn to the environmental sea change that occurred in January 2021. Since taking office, President Biden and Vice President Harris, their team has overturned 98 of former President Trump's deregulation actions, and they are currently working to roll back another 77. In addition, the Biden-Harris administration has approved 107 new policies and is currently working to add another 71. On his first day in office, with Vice President Harris at his side, President Biden canceled the Keystone XL pipeline and rejoined the Paris Climate Accords. The Biden-Harris team have made climate change a national security priority for the Pentagon. Under President Biden and Vice President Harris, the Justice Department, the Energy Department, and the Environmental Protection Agency are now focusing on environmental justice. For example, last November, the EPA rolled out $2 billion worth of grants for lower-income communities who are on the front lines of climate change, the largest investment in environmental justice in United States history. These grants will address urban heat islands and wildfires, assess the impact of climate change on health, work to clean toxic pollution, and accelerate clean energy development and workforce training. In the fall of 2021, the Biden-Harris team succeeded in getting Congress to pass the infrastructure bill that included over $200 billion for climate-related projects. A year later, in August 2022, Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act, also known as the IRA. And it was Vice President Kamala Harris who cast the tie-breaking vote. The $370 billion in the IRA was the largest climate commitment any country had ever made. And because it's in the form of tax credits, if people take full advantage of this opportunity, and that's what they're doing, America will invest over a trillion dollars in climate and energy-related projects. As part of the Inflation Reduction Act in April, the Environmental Protection Agency announced the Solar for All program. It allocates $7 billion to 60 organizations 
to help nearly one million residents of low-income neighborhoods go solar. It's a big step in the current administration's commitment to ensure that green investments directly benefit marginalized communities. In addition to that, the IRA explicitly grants the EPA authority to regulate greenhouse gas pollution, as well as to encourage the transition to clean energy sources, including wind and solar energy. Last November, the EPA proposed a first-of-its-kind rule mandating local water utilities to replace all of their lead pipes to protect citizens from neurotoxins that can harm children. Under the proposed rule, utilities would have 10 years to dig up the estimated 9.2 million lead service lines left in the United States and would also lower the lead testing threshold for which utilities are mandated to take action. A pediatrician who worked as a key researcher exposing the Flint water crisis said, this is like a pediatrician's dream come true. 9,000 young people have already begun working as part of the new American Climate Corps, modeled after President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Civilian Conservation Corps. In April 2024, the EPA issued a new regulation that would force the country's coal-fired power plants to reduce their greenhouse pollution by 90% by 2039 or shut down. The EPA also issued a new tailpipe pollution limits to accelerate the shift to all-electric or hybrid vehicles. The New York Times points out that this rule would eliminate more greenhouse gas emissions than any other climate rule in the nation's history. In January, the Biden-Harris administration announced that oil and gas companies would be required for the first time to pay a fee for emitting methane. The Biden-Harris Energy Department finalized a new rule meant to speed up federal permits for new major trans, uh, trans, transmission lines, which are essential to the transition to renewable energy plants. The Biden-Harris Interior Department blocked oil, coal, and gas mining operations across millions of acres of irreplaceable wildlands in the Alaskan wilderness. The Biden-Harris Interior Department also established a climate task force to coordinate the prioritization of climate change to agency decision-making. This task force will work to ensure climate change is appropriately analyzed and that tribes and environmental justice communities are appropriately engaged. The Biden-Harris White House has also issued regulations to protect wildlife, rid municipal water systems of forever chemicals, and limit pollution from industrial and chemical plants that make people sick. It, be, it bears mentioning that many states have already sued the federal government to stop the implementation of some of these rules. And finally, the Biden-Harris White House paused, uh, paused the permitting process for new liquid natural gas terminals. Bill McKibben described this as the biggest thing a U.S. president has ever done to stand up to the fossil fuel industry. Well, that wraps up our look back at the actual records of both Trump and the Biden-Harris administration. Now, before we turn our attention to what we can expect when either Trump or a Democratic nominee takes office in January 2025, there's a point that I really must make. Humanity is in the midst of a planetary crisis when it comes to climate, and we are running out of time. That's why I'm speaking to you tonight. If we are to avert unimaginable disaster on an unprecedented scale, we must embrace our generation's call, our assignment, our vocation, as we accelerate the pace of change 
by adopting new habits, by welcoming new patterns, by amplifying justice, reducing conflict, and shifting our cost-benefit analysis to include the impacts on future generations as well as the entire biosphere. Will the voting public embrace the systemic changes that will result if our leaders address the climate crisis effectively? Climate scientists like Michael Mann and countless others are asking this question. Together, those who vote in the upcoming election will give their answer. Let me now assess former President Trump's plans, policies, promises, and pledges when it comes to what he will do on climate, energy, and the environment. In 2020, as some of you will recall, the Republican Party did away with a written party platform. In 2024, the Republican Party platform fails to mention climate, environment, or air or water pollution, or the EPA. So this brief summary of what we can expect is based on former President Trump's public comments and the Trump campaign website. Trump has said that he will once again remove the United States from the Paris Climate Accords. A second Trump administration will expedite federal drilling permits, speed up approval for, for fracked gas pipelines, and open up vast stores of oil and gas for extraction on public lands. He will rescind every, excuse me, he will rescind every energy and climate related regulation that the Biden administration has instituted, including rules to reduce auto emission and improve vehicle fuel economy, energy efficiency standards for light bulbs and appliances, and power plant regulations. Trump will provide tax breaks for oil, gas, and coal producers while axing what he has called insane wind subsidies. He will unwind new EPA limits on pollution from power plants, including coal-fired power plants. Trump has promised to reclassify tens of thousands of career civil servants, making it easier to fire them. In April, Trump hosted the CEOs of many of the country's largest oil, coal, and gas companies and told them that if they would collectively donate $1 billion to his campaign, he would initiate regulatory rollbacks that would save the fossil fuel industry billions of dollars. At that dinner, Trump vowed that on day one of his presidency, he would end the Biden administration's freeze on permits for new liquefied natural gas exports. Another source of the actions former President Trump is likely to take if he is reelected is the 900 plus page report called Project 2025. Assembled by the Conservative Heritage Foundation at a cost of $22 million, Project 2025 is a playbook for the first 180 days of an incoming Republican presidential administration. In 2022, when former President Trump spoke at the launch of Project 2025, he cheered the project on. I'm quoting Trump now. Our country is going to hell. This is a great group, and they're going to lay the groundwork and detail plans for exactly what our movement will do when the American people give us a colossal mandate to save America, and that's coming, unquote. In August 2023, the director of Project 2025 told the New York Times that one of its aims is, and I'm quoting now, to investigate whether the dimensions of climate change exist. When asked about the role of fossil fuel in driving climate breakdown, he told the Times, I'm quoting, I think the science is still out on that, quite frankly. 
end quote. Here are a few of Project 2025's proposals. The Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act would both be repealed. And just to be clear, according to an analysis based on a study in the journal Science and on modeling research done by the Rhodium Group, the repeal of the Inflation Reduction Act could cost more than $900 billion in global climate damage. Regarding the Environmental Protection Agency, on day one, an executive order would be issued requiring reconsideration of the agency's structure, including freezing existing regulations, eliminating many of the 8,000 EPA employees, stopping all grants to community groups, eliminating EPA's Office of Environmental Justice, and slashing the agency's budget. Fire the 140 engineers, chemists, toxicologists, lawyers, and economists at the National Vehicle and Fuel Emissions Laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and replace them with non-scientist political employees so that we no longer have reliable scientific data on automobile and truck pollution. A high priority recommendation is to try to scrap the Global Change, the Global Change Research Act of 1990, which requires the publication of the National Climate Assessments. The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, commonly referred to as NOAA, would be broken up and downsized, I'm quoting, broken up and downsized, in part because NOAA has become, I'm quoting again, one of the main drivers of the climate change alarm industry, end quote. In addition, the scientists doing climate change research for the Office of Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Research would be disbanded. The Federal Energy Regula Regulatory Commission, commonly known as FERC, would be prohibited from considering greenhouse gas emissions and authorizing new pipelines and liquefied natural gas export facilities. Finally, Politico reports that the oil industry is drafting proposed language for these executive orders. While much more could be said, let me conclude by sharing climate scientist Michael Mann's comments. Should the policies outlined in Project 2025 actually be implemented, Professor Mann says, I'm quoting, it would be game over for climate progress in the United States, turning the reins of our government over to the polluters. And the absence of American leadership, in the absence of American leadership, global efforts to reduce carbon emissions and avoid catastrophic warming will likely fail, end quote. Now, for the concluding segment of my presentation, here are the plans, policies, promises, and pledges we can expect if the Democratic nominee is elected. While a fully developed plan has not yet been made available, it's safe to assume that the Democratic ticket will continue to urge the public to make the fullest use of tax rebates available through the Inflation Reduction Act. The Democratic ticket will continue to keep climate justice for marginalized communities at the center of their policies, and the ticket will continue to push citizens and industry to, as they say, electrify everything. In these and other ways, if elected, the Democratic ticket will build on the historic record and progress of Biden's presidency. Last September, President Biden not only made his position clear, he was representing the unwavering position of his party. Biden said, and I'm quoting, the only existential threat humanity faces, even more frightening than a nuclear war, is global warming going above 1.5 degrees in the next 20 or perhaps 10 years. 
that would be real trouble. There's no way back from that, end quote. As for specific policies, the Democratic nominee's ability to advance any policy depends partly on which party controls the House and the Senate. Nevertheless, former administration officials have shared with reporters the following likely plans. Upgrading perhaps 100,000 miles of existing electric transmission lines along with building out thousands of miles of new lines. This is what we need to electrify everything. Rapidly scale, scale up energy storage solutions. Overcoming the bottlenecks so that we can implement and deploy more clean energy. Provide the appropriate incentives so that we can use the batteries of electric vehicles to help supplement the grid when there's a spike in energy usage. Initiate a plan to decarbonize the industrial sector, including the production of cement, steel, and aluminum. Prioritize and fund resilience and adaptation programs that allow frontline communities to deal with a warmer world. Focus on nature-based solutions, such as building out coastal wetlands to serve as a carbon sink and better handle extreme storms. Expand urban tree planting programs to provide the much needed cooling in cities like Phoenix. And finally, develop better tools to measure and confirm and verify the benefits of such programs so that they will attract more rapid capital investment. Well, I hope that this account of what's at stake in relation to the climate crisis and environmental pollution, along with the climate and environmental plans, policies, promises, and pledges of each of the presidential candidates will help you make an informed decision when you go to the polls. Thank you very much, and now I'm glad to respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. And um, I want to invite people who are on Zoom to um, put your questions in the chat, and Vin will share them with us. For the uh, the two major acts of the Biden administration that you you described, uh, if the 2025 plan is to repeal those, and if that requires Congress to act, and if uh, they don't have a Republican House and Senate and so forth. What could an administration do uh, as to the implementation of those acts uh, to, to put the brakes on, uh, even though the acts themselves would, would continue? So, so thank you. And that, that's a terrific question. And it, it may seem to some listening to it that it's a technical question, but it's certainly a possible scenario, right? That, that Trump could get elected, but the House or the Senate or both could end up being Democratic. Um, under those conditions, the, the first thing that comes, to, well, first of all, the direct answer to your question is, while the White House could propose the repeal of those acts, they could not be repealed without the support, I, I don't know if it's the House or the Senate, but they could not be repealed without the support of that. However, however, a recent Supreme Court decision, the uh, Chevron deference, is, uh, it, so I'm not a legal expert, and I know there are legal experts here, but my understanding of that is it essentially shifts the burden of interpreting um, envi the, 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 uh, the relevancy of environmental science to, to laws. It shifts the burden of that from the EPA, where you have 8,000 scientists employed, to the justice system where you have judges, most of whom did not major in science in college. Let's just be clear. Um, and so the way of, to your, the point of your question is, well, how would this play out? Well, if they can't actually rescind the act, what they can do in, in the post-Chevron decision, what they can do is, is uh, continue to appoint very conservative justices and begin to implement this system in which the judicial branch of our government 
will be burdened with the scientific interpretation of implementing the various rules which Congress has, uh, has passed in relation to the environment. And all I can say is good luck with that. <laughs> Another question. All right, this is going to be a tough question, I know. That. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, I'm beginning to detect a difference in the parties. <laughs> uh, what uh, a lot of the uh, problem now, uh, and, and has been, is outside the U.S. The U.S. emissions are down to maybe 12% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. So there's a huge challenge of international action. Uh, do you have any sense of, um, uh, of how the, uh, that focus on the global dimensions, the international dimensions of the problem might be resolved uh, or addressed by the two, two parties or the two candidates? So uh, thanks for that question. And you know, this is, this is uh, this is one way of framing what is the biggest challenge facing humanity right now, is, is that you know, the United Nations, uh, or, or I should say the Paris Climate Accord has 193 signatories, right? Um, and, um, and yet, um, none of them, actually there's like one or two of them, if I recall correctly, are actually living up to their, to their promised plans, one or two out of 193, okay? So obviously it's a more environmentally friendly thing that Biden put us back in the Paris Climate Accord. Um, but to Gus's point, if we pull out of the Paris Climate Accord, that action alone only constitutes a significant fraction, it's still a significant fraction, of the overall uh, global warming tendency as a consequence of the burning of fossil fuel worldwide. So what, what I would, the, the distinction between the two candidates or the, or the two parties that I would emphasize here is that um, on, on the Trump side and also on the Republican Party side, um, they do not think it is their job in any way to restrict or limit corporate freedom to make as much money as it can by extracting <coughs> and selling natural resources, full stop. And the Democratic uh, uh, Party and candidates recognize the scientific consensus doesn't even begin to describe you know, the, the uh, preponderance of scientists who recognize global uh, climate emergency going on. Um, by recognizing that the Democratic candidates and party are going to do everything they can, not just to shore up the Paris Accord, but for us to abide by our part. And once we, once we sort of get on track for that and we're moving in that direction, then to begin to leverage our influence with other countries to do so. Um, that, that's, that's the best answer I can give to your to your question, Gus, but it's a very, very important question. There's um, uh, a person known to many of you in this audience, Jeffrey Sachs, who uh, is somebody I've known for a long time. We lived together in, in Newton, uh, and our kids grew up together a little bit. Um, he had a piece uh, that he put out today. It was focused on um, nuclear weapons and peace, world peace, but it was essentially the same question you're asking, Gus, as to, you know, how, how in God's name can we, in relation to nuclear weapons or in relation to climate change, bring the world together? Um, so if, if you're interested in things that Jeffrey Sachs thinks, just Google, Google it, and it's a great essay. Another question. So I have two questions. My first question is you spoke with a lot of certainty about what the, uh, the Democratic candidate, whoever it may be, will do. What made you speak with such certainty? 
uh, beca- the, the, the main point is, is, was the actual first point that I made is the universal unflinching alignment and acceptance of science. And that's what drives the, the Democratic Party. Now, if, if you know a bunch of climate scientists like I do, they actually disagree on a bunch, <laughs> bunch of things. But those disagreements are like you know, little footnotes down here compared to the, the, you know, the big alarm bells going on and major things we need to do. Um, so that, that's, that's the main answer to your question. It's a, good, it's a very good question. All right, thank you. Um, my second question is, so one of the things you talked about were like changing emissions on cars with the end goal of ending up with all hybrid or electric. And it seems like that is an example of a lot of changes that would be excellent for climate, but hybrid and electric cars are very expensive. Um, and it seems like a lot of these changes would put would be economically stressful. So are there plans to mitigate that? Uh, so, as it turns out, um, batteries are an essential part of hybrid or an all-electric car, and the cost of the battery is one of the things that makes that car more expensive. Um, and just as a footnote, an all-electric car does not have an internal combustion engine. It, everybody, you understand what I'm saying. And therefore, you don't have to take it in for an oil change and take it in for new carburetor and take it in and take it in and take it in and take it in. That's one of the um, ironies for the auto industry is that when they produce an electric car, it doesn't require the kind of regular maintenance that an internal combustion engine requires. But back to your question. the the reality in terms of battery science over the past like four years is that batteries, uh, if you talk about the cutting edge science of battery production, batteries just in four years have uh, become uh, you know twice, first twice as good uh, and then another twice as good just in the course of four years. So, you know, many, many of us remember that when computers were first um, uh, developed, Moore's Law was invoked. And it's, it's variously uh, reported out as to every one and a half years or every two years, the capacity of the CPU would double. And that's basically been proven, you know, since, I don't know if it's since the mid-50s or the mid-60s that Moore's Law has been applied uh, to that. This is, this is past Moore's, Moore's Law. This is accelerating faster than computer chips accelerated. And so as a consequence, to the point of your question, the price of hybrid and all electric vehicles will begin to reflect the fact that batteries will be able to go 500 miles, no problem, and they'll cost a fraction of what they cost today. And it, uh, one final comment. Um, in terms of the transition, the main thing that is holding up the transition to hybrid and electric vehicles is the disinformation campaign that is being prosecuted by those who want to retain the status quo. That is the main thing. So it's, it's not that there's an honest debate about this. It's there are a bunch of people who have, for whatever reason, accepted the disinformation as reality, and then there's a bunch of people who aren't buying into that. Finally, back to your original point, it is more expensive now, absolutely. I'm glad, I'm glad you pointed that out, but very soon it won't be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just in tying into his question it, and your answers, it seems like the Chinese, I know they're trying to flood our market with very cheap cars, but they're able to produce cars at a fraction of the cost of our manufacturers or the Japanese manufacturers and with much longer mileage uh, range and um, now, in part, they control a, a great portion of the um, lithium mining, 
but it seems like part of the our push should be better communication with other countries, including China, better cooperation uh, so that we are all working in the same direction of creating electric cars that are much more affordable and better. That's Amen. <laughs> and I, I mean, this is, the, you know, your, your, your point um, uh, really lifts up the challenging moment our world economy is in right now. Um, you know, if, if we took seriously, I, I'll even say it more provocatively, if we loved our children and if we loved our grandchildren worldwide, if we all loved our children and grandchildren, the amount of cooperation, to your point of your question, the amount of cooperation we would immediately engage in, scientific cooperation as well as industrial cooperation, it, it would just skyrocket and this transition would become a kind of a, isn't this great as opposed to, you know, a floor fight at, at, every, at every level. Yeah, so thank you for your question. Jim, um, some people have talked about nuclear power plants um, and smaller scale plants that reuse waste. I mean, we have one and we have nuclear waste in Vernon just sitting there with an infrastructure already built. Um, is that, is, are those, and with zero carbon emissions, is that really feasible, or what, what's your thought about it? So it, it's a really important question. Um, and uh, notable climate scientists are in very different camps on this. James Hansen, personal friend of mine, I've been in jail with him. Uh, and, and he's widely regarded as our foremost climate scientist, although you know, he's, I, I think he's maybe 80 years old now. Um, and he's at Columbia. Uh, James Hansen is a big advocate of the new, safer, smaller, at, to the point of your question, new, safer, and smaller nuclear reactors. And, and his support for that is motivated, of course, again by your point, because it's carbon-free electricity, which, uh, which we need, absolutely. Um, but if, if you look at Mark Jacobson out, out at Stanford, who is, I think, widely regarded as the person who has done the most and best research on, on each, each, each state in the United States and every individual country worldwide on their transition path from where they're at now to a completely renewable economy. If, if you look at what Mark Jacobson says out of Stanford, he says, we don't need it. And why risk the dangers of multiplying the um, you know, spent nuclear fuel uh, uh, deposits, you know, which would be you know, littering um, the world in terms of small nuclear reactors? Now, Bill Gates, for, as many of you know, takes the opposite view. And the Gates Foundation has funded uh, the, the new research, much of the new research that's going into the development of these smaller, safer nuclear reactors. Um, the, the final comment I would make is when you dig into the weeds just a little bit, you don't have to go very far into the weeds, just get your fingernails dirty, what you discover is that any nuclear reactor built in the past 20 years including ones that are kind of in the design phase right now, are, most of them come in 10 years late and more than double their original estimated cost. Uh, that's just a fact. Um, so th those are the many dimensions that, that I'm familiar with related uh, to your question. Yeah, thank you. So one question wasn't enough, huh, Gus? Well, 
this, this is more of a comment than a question, but I'd love your response to it. Um, China today, I want to you know, sort of say something hopeful here and positive. Uh, it, it gives you a sense of what uh, could happen with the right leadership, uh, not only in this country, but in many other countries. Uh, we're all familiar with the, with the mine site uh, solar uh, facility here. Uh, a, a solar array about 200 times uh, larger than that, 200 times larger than what we see here, uh, would begin to approximate uh, uh, the output of a nuclear power plant, a standard nuclear power plant today, sort of gigawatt plant. And um, what I'm reading, and there's major articles in The Economist magazine on this recently, um, is that um, China is today constructing and uh, making ready to go five times that amount every week. Almost a, a nuclear power plant a day in solar is being deployed in China today. But just to be clear, Gus, you're saying it, it's solar, it's solar uh, plants that they're deploying. They're, they're not deploying the nuclear thing, but it's the equivalent of the nuclear. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, and so it's, as I say, uh, 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 almost uh, five uh, nucleus plant size solar production. Uh, a, a week uh, is happening now. So this is phenomenal uh, what's going on. And uh, it just gives you a sense of, um, you know, uh, uh, of how much we could do with solar power uh, if we have the right kind of leadership and, uh, and, and we get busy with the right uh, policies to, to, to you know, carry that forward. So it's, it's very hopeful, I think. Uh, that we could really be uh, transforming to renewables uh, at, at that scale, enormous uh, for, uh, what China is doing, and give them credit for it. They're also producing uh, the largest uh, emissions of greenhouse gases on the planet by far now, uh, also. But, um, you know, give the devil his due. Let, let, let me let me uh, just comment on what Gus said first. Um, uh, uh, so, so I, I I couldn't agree more uh, with what you've just said, Gus. And and we don't. No matter what your ideological perspective is, we don't just get enough objective information about, for example, China's incredible commitment around solar installations in this regard. Um, it's, it's available if you search for it, uh, you know, from obscure sources, but it cer certainly isn't making headlines or front page news. Something else not making front page news, not unrelated to what Gus said. It, it's my understanding uh, that recently Texas surpassed California as the state with the greatest solar installation. I won't ask for a show of hands of who knew that. <laughs> but it's obscure, right? We don't, we're just unfamiliar with that sort of a thing. Uh, another another uh, you know, piece of good news in, in the spirit of what Gus said is that for more than 100 days out of the past 120 days, California has uh, all of the energy that California has needed has come from renewable sources. It's, it's completely mind-blowing. And it just, if you follow this guy, I forget who it is who, who does this specific reporting on Twitter, it's just mind-blowing day after mind-blowing day, and the graphs are all there and, and, and everything. Uh, and again, it's, you know, why, is it, why isn't it the case that our media system isn't elevating news like that? To us, I, this is not an ideological perspective that I'm I'm voicing when I say that. Okay, another question. So, uh, Jim. Yes. 
thank you very much. You're a fabulous communicator. Thank you. So here's the question. <laughs> Set up. <laughs> the people in this sanctuary are not going to decide the election. It's going to be decided by the people in three states. Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. There are seven battleground, but those, those three are indispensable. You can't win without them in the Electoral College, which is all that matters. The popular vote, as we all know, doesn't matter. So the question is this. If all the polls are right, climate isn't even in the top 10 list on people's minds. It's the price of groceries. It's the price of gasoline. It's the interest rates on their credit cards. How do we, who are so invested in this issue, climate, environment, survival, um, how, how do we communicate with our fellow citizens in those three states just how critical November 5th really is? So a uh, couple of responses. Uh, th this is such an important question. Um, the first response is just a point of information that is, a, that is directly takes on this question and all of you uh, you might just want to make a note of this if you don't already know of the program. The Environmental Voter Project, okay, Environmental Voter Project. It's run by a guy named Nathaniel Sennett, and um, he and I did a program together uh, back at uh, the, whatever, whatever it's called now, Gus, the school you used to head, the School of the Environment at Yale. Uh, yeah, it's, thank you. Um, and, and so I've known Nathaniel now for, I guess, eight or, eight or ten years. And what they seek to do, to your point, is to focus on the states where each vote matters through separate data gathering. They identify people whose number one issue is either climate or the environment and with yet separate data gathering who among those people did not vote in the last election? And it turns out it's tens of thousands of people in these swing states who, for whom environment or climate is their number one issue and they didn't vote in the last election. And so postcards, phone calls, et cetera, in order to try to motivate these environmental voters. So that's one very direct and kind of incremental answer to your question. Now a more broad-based response to your question. Um, it, in terms of climate communications, when you're talking with someone who uh, may see the world differently than you do, the most important first question, the engagement question, is what do you care about? That's the most important engagement question. What do you care about? And once you begin to gain enough trust in the conversation that you're each of you reciprocally sharing with one another what you each care about, then a small pivot, let me tell you how the climate crisis is going to negatively impact what you care about. That's the conversation that needs to happen. And um, Catherine Hayhoe, who is um, maybe next to James Hansen, the foremost climate scientist in America, lives in Texas, by the way, um, and uh, is an evangelical Christian. Oh, really? And, and she is by far and away the, the best person on the subject of climate communication. And so she's done videos, she, she's done everything. If you just look up H-A-Y-H-O-E is her last name. And the plethora of, of 
of media things that, uh, that, that, that are available uh, from her are infinite and enormous. And, and it provides a map that essentially responds to your question. Um, the thing is, we, we just have to make that happen. We just, you know, I, I, I'll be doing a program with pastors in Wisconsin uh, sometime next month. Um, and the focus of my program will be to help guide them as to preaching a climate sermon, uh, also an election sermon, sometime in the next couple of months. And, and uh, all of them will have exactly the question that you just asked, you know, you know I might be fired is, 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 you know, coming from most of their mouths. And trying to navigate that with a collar on is, is challenging. That's kind of my arena of expertise, if, if you will. But it, it's just one dimension of the very, very, very important question uh, that you raise. Um, it, 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 and then, then just to take your question and, and make it personal, if any of you have people who uh, sort of routine, or family members who routinely take the opposite view of whatever your view may be, um, the, the, again, the best way to bridge is to try to at attempt to communicate with each other about things that you value and possibly value in common, and then begin to address how climate change affects those things. And it, it, the pocketbook will still be an issue. The, the credit card interest rate will still be an issue, but it might introduce to them an, another dimension, which they may have space to allow it in, or they may not. Um, you know, it's, it's quite remarkable, all you folks sitting here, for this very wonky presentation that, that I made. But somehow, you came here because you knew you needed to make enough space in your life to pay attention to this stuff. And what, what has to happen in the next 10 years, to the point of your question, is more and more people who are not at all paying attention now because they just don't have space in their life, they have to make more space to pay attention to this. We have to, we have, we human beings have to shift from being creatures who are immediately caught up in, you know, what is immediately affecting me on the most short term basis to creatures who also, in addition to that, consider more long term effects. And as I argue in, in my book, um, we need to shift the golden rule from being something which operates on a, a real-time basis, my neighbor, my neighbor, I, I treat my neighbor fairly as, as I would want them to treat me. We have to expand that to include treatment of yet unborn generations. And no religious leader ever thought of that. Why? Because never before our generation, never before did people have the capacity to wreck life for future generations. With the evolution of the nuclear weapon and now with climate change, we, our generation has that capacity. And ethics has not caught up with that. Ethics of, of any religious perspective is based essentially on the golden rule. It goes by different names in different cultures. Um, but that, that needs to expand to include yet unborn generations. And, uh, and that's something which in, a, in an effective conversation like that is eventually going to find its way in, in terms of caring for your children. That's why, you know, I think one of the most powerful things that I said is that th there's no scientific doubt that the past decade is the hottest decade any human being has ever experienced, and it will be the coolest decade your children and grandchildren will ever experience. And no matter what your, your political perspective, when, when people hear that, if, if, if they're willing to accept science, and not everyone is, you know, there's still four or six percent of people that just would dump that. But, but for 94 percent of people, they, they would kind of be frozen in their tracks, realizing that. And, and, then, and then further conversation, to your point, further conversation ensues, and maybe action and, and maybe a redirection of life, or as I like to, to say, 
a, a, re, a new understanding of our calling, our vocation, because we happen to have been born in this generation on the hinge of history. Yeah. Hi, thank you for a great talk. Thank you. So I'm going to bring up a little separate question. Um, the batteries that we have in our cars and our wall batteries at home have lithium in yes. them. And I've talked with a number of people who are very upset about lithium mining, both the wreckage of the land where it's mined from and the conditions uh, and, and um, injustice towards the people that are mining it. Do you have any information? I know people are working not only on more efficient batteries, but on batteries that use things other than lithium. And I would be interested in any information you might have about how that's coming along. So uh, uh, everything you said is, is spot on. That's the first thing I want to say. So you're, you're very well informed. Um, uh, and, and yes, it's, it's appropriate at this stage of battery evolution to be concerned and, and wringing our hands over the injustice associated with a significant, I, 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 I can't tell you what percentage of lithium mining is, is taking place in, a, in severely unjust circumstances, but plenty of it. And, and it's, it's, it's appropriate to, to draw our attention to that. But as you also suggest, battery technology is, is, uh, is first recognizing um, the scarcity of lithium and beginning to pursue other, other pathways, particularly with, with um, elements uh, uh, in, in, in making up the battery that are not these very precious and rare elements. There's, there's a ton of, of that going on. Um, but it's also the case that, um, I don't want to put this, let me, let me say it in a positive way. It is increasingly the case that more and more lithium is becoming available in ways that we can harness that lithium without without necessarily pursuing, doing it in unjust ways. Now, there's also lithium, lithium mining, if you will, that, it, that some scientists are suggesting, for example, from the ocean bottom. And there's, there's, there, there are oceanographers that are just going crazy over this suggestion because of the, 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 the horror it would uh, create. Uh, for our, um, uh, you know, ocean biosphere. Um, so, it, so you're right to put your finger. It's, it's a big issue. And I, at least, my own personal position on this is so long as uh, folks who care about justice and injustice continue to express our, our uh, opposition to this, uh, the science will find a way that will be a more just direction. And I, and, I, and I think they're also starting to get lithium back out of batteries that have come to the end of the Oh, the recycling of batteries. This is a, this is a big deal. Um, and, and, the, the, and literally the reuse of literal batteries. So like you pop it out of your car and you put it in your home. And then Green Mountain Power takes advantage of it being in your home when they have a power surge. Um, the, the, there are all these schemes are beginning to get implemented, and um, how shall I put it? Ten years, for, so so long as we <laughs> back to, back to the subject matter of our gathering, so long as we uh, uh, provide leadership not only in this country but worldwide that continues to support the scientific advance, ten years from now. Uh, uh, it's, it, it's all going to appear very different than it appears now. Uh, and that's an economic reality and, and there's scientific backing for it. Yeah. Thank you for that. Please. I have two points. <clears throat> First, I'm an oceanographer. <laughs> and the idea of the deep sea mining is absolutely unacceptable. The second thing is that Climate change and Earth's, Earth's warming is not an on-off switch. 
you can stop putting all the fossil CO2 in the atmosphere. But the feedbacks that you get, I can name just two. First, the ocean. The ocean goes from being a sink for CO2 to a source for CO2. The other is the Arctic. And the, um, the release of methane in the Arctic now from the melting of the permafrost is a major, major source of, of greenhouse gases. So even if we stop all production of fossil fuel, <coughs> we have hundreds of years. So it's not just our grandchildren, it's our grandchildren to the nth degree. Thank you for that, yeah. I, oh, and one other point please. of irony. As I remember, Richard Nixon was the one under whom EPA began. Yes. <laughs> kind of interesting, he's the same in party as the guy who wants to end EPA. <laughs> Just an aside. It's, 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 <laughs> it's also worth noting in, in, in relation to what you just said um, about Nixon that, of course, the first Earth Day occurred uh, under, under Nixon. It was co-sponsored by a Democrat and a Republican, the first Earth Day, and 10% of people living in America were out in the streets. 10%. That would be 33 million people taking action in relation to the environment. That's what the first Earth Day was, in fact. And you know, we need, we need more recognition, more universality uh, like that. Yeah. Other, other questions? Vid, anything on, on the chat? Okay. And we're, we'll, uh, we'll close in about five minutes. I want to go back to the um, faith community religion topic. Uh, I read your book a few years ago. We had a wonderful book group discussion about it here at this church three or four years ago. I, I was immensely encouraged by your book to learn how much faith communities are embracing the environment and the climate change uh, challenge. So I kind of have a twofold question. One, are you encouraged yourself? Uh, and I haven't read the new edition. But then also, especially in the face of what appears to be uh, the point of view of conservative evangelicals, uh, who, if I understand them correctly, don't believe in climate change at all because they think God calls all the shots. So it's sort of a twofold question. Yep. Are you encouraged on the one hand, or are you discouraged because of that other point of view? So uh, I'm gonna put these two questions uh, together and talk about young evangelicals. So it turns out that evangelicals under 30 are, uh, are all in on climate as a faith issue. Uh, they're all in on recognizing our obligation to protect, protect God's creation. And it's really only the old guard in the leadership of the evangelical movement, if you will, who continue this, this rap saying either climate change is a bunch of bunk or they say um, uh, uh, on an eschatological basis, um, why don't we hasten the time when the earth falls apart because then Jesus will come again. Yeah. Uh, they're the same folks that are in, it, literally encouraging and sending funds to encourage a massive Middle East war on the plains of Armageddon. So, so yes, you have that faction of the evangelical church, but it is, it's completely inaccurate to say that any of that applies to young evangelicals. So what I want to say is I am encouraged in, in the years as a, as a faith leader nationally that I've been involved, I am encouraged. Uh, it's our denomination, the United Church of Christ, that has been the principal leader of this, but there are, there are representatives in every denomination. 
and including Pope Francis, of course. And in, in the Orthodox Church, uh, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, he was releasing um, uh, official pastoral letters on climate um, when, when, the, when the Rio gathering first gathered in 1990. Um, so, so there is consistent religious leadership in this and expanding religious involvement in this. I, am I satisfied with that? I, am I satisfied that like, you know, and anybody who's going to worship on, on Sunday uh, recognizes the uh, uh, importance of, uh, uh, as a person of faith, of addressing climate in whatever, using whatever gifts they have. Uh, no, I'm not at all satisfied. Um, but it's, but it's, it's, it's been this gradual progress and young people of faith, particularly young evangelicals, they're all in on this. So thank you for your question. Yeah. I think maybe go in there. Is that if that's okay with you? Should yeah, you that's good. I'll return. I'll return. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you. What a what a wonderful presentation, and um, and thank you uh, for everyone who uh, uh, helped make this uh, event possible. Um, thank you for being here. Um, thank you to those of you who are online. Um, and we hope to post a recording uh, of this event on our on our website. So uh, just keep your eye out for it. Um, we hope that you'll linger for informal uh, conversation over refreshments out on the lawn. Um, we also hope that you'll not only vote, uh, but also work for the nation and world you want to see. Um, uh, clearly, um, it's crucial. And um, and just addressing, you know, how you know how do we raise this from being not in the top 10 uh, issues. It's the only way, when, when after Greta had done her thing and, and the youth and, and us in Stratford uh, out in front of Barrett Hall, um, that the following election, it was high on people's agenda because we used our voice. And so use your voice how in whatever way you can and give your resources to those who are out using their voices. Um, uh, for whoever, uh, whatever candidate you support, whatever position. Um, and uh, please, you know, please do this. Uh, so much is at stake. Uh, I mean, everything is at stake in this historic moment. So thank you for all you will do uh, and are doing.